This section, um, we're going to talk about two um, conditions. The first one that I'm going to talk about is acute myocardial infarctions, and obviously this is an extremely important section since uh, this is something that you should be able to recognize. So we're going to go over some pitfalls and uh, some important information with respect to various uh, myocardial infarctions. The one that you'll for sure see, and it's very common, is inferior myocardial infarctions. Inferior MIs typically manifest as ST elevations in 2, 3, and AVF. Usually the height of the ST segment elevation is greater in lead 3 than lead 2. So you have a height that's far greater in lead 3 than lead 2, and you have your ST elevation in AVF. Uh, this ST segment elevation is typically um, how you'll see once in a while, you see not as much elevation in lead 2, but 3 in AVF is the predominant features. The associated reciprocal changes that you'll see is in 1 and AVL. Sometimes you may not see as much depression in one, but you'll see greater ST, uh, the, the ST, the ST segment depression in AVL. A rule that you should remember, if you have ST elevation in lead three and you have depression in AVL, you are most likely dealing with inferior myocardial infarction you should remember this rule. So if your eye catches ST elevation in lead three and depression in AVL, regardless of what else is going on, you should be really looking for inferior myocardial infarction. That's, the, that's a very important one because you may not see as much elevations in lead two or sometimes in AVF or you may not see much depression in lead V1, but this reciprocal pattern of lead three versus AVL, it's an important one for you to remember. And if you see it, regardless of what else is going on in the EKG, you should be really thinking about inferior myocardial infarction. Inferior myocardial infarctions occur from right coronary artery occlusion. The right coronary artery comes out and as it comes out, it bifurcates. It gives one branch to the right ventricle, and it goes back, wraps around the back of the heart, and it supplies the inferior part of the left ventricle. As it goes down, in about 80% of the population, you have a branch called the posterior descending artery that comes off of the right coronary artery, the branch that goes behind the heart. So, you have a branch that comes out, it bifurcates, one vessel goes to right ventricle, and the other one goes in the back, it goes into posterior descending artery, and it continues and supplies the inferior part of the left ventricle. So depending on where the blockage is, if the blockage is really proximal before the bifurcation, you're gonna have decreased blood supply to your right ventricle, as well as your inferior posterior aspect of your heart. So a right coronary occl occlusion can give you ischemic features in the right ventricle, in the inferior part of the left ventricle, and posterior part of the left ventricle. So when we have an inferior myocardial infarction, which manifests, manifests as ST elevation in lead two, three, and AVF, we always look for right ventricular infarction and posterior infarction. When that can happen, if your blockage is really proximal, if the blockage is past the bifurcation where it supplies the right ventricle, you may only have inferior posterior MI. 
you may not have right ventricular component to it. So depend on where, where the blockage is. The blockage is really proximal, you're going to get right ventricular involvement and inferior posterior involvement. If the blockage is right past the bifurcation where it gives a supply to the right ventricle, then your right ventricle is okay. The only part that you're affecting is the inferior posterior mine. If it passes the PDA, the posterior descending artery, the only part that will be will be your inferior part, your posterior part will be okay. So we may have three scenarios with inferior myocardial infarction. One is that you have the right ventricle involved, inferior involved, and the posterior aspect of the left ventricle involved. The second phenomenon is that you only have inferior posterior MI, your right ventricle is okay. And the third phenomenon is that your right ventricle is okay, the posterior aspect is okay, and the only part that's involved is the inferior one. So we look for those things. So the most important one with um, all of those things is the right ventricle, because when the right ventricle is involved, you are very much preload dependent. Your right ventricle is not working, is not pushing as much blood to the other side. So you can be hypotensive, for example, if you give nitrates and beta blockers and morphine and things like that, because all of those things, to some extent, reduce preload. So we don't want to give those things. That's why IV fluids is very important in, in patients who have right ventricular involvement or not. If you give them nitro, they're going to be hypotensive, and obviously that is not something we want in the setting of acute MI. So how do we look for right ventricular infarction? There are two ways you can look at it. One is that you can get right-sided leads. So a typical teaching is that in order for you to get right-sided leads, you're going to remove all the left-side leads to the right side. You don't really need to do that. The main thing that we care about, the main thing that you're looking at, is what happens in lead V4. So lead V4 normally sits on the fifth intercostal space mid-clavicular line. Fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. That's the, where the lead V4 is. You're going to take another sticker and put it right on the other side. Don't remove this sticker. Remember, we always keep our stickers. We don't move any stickers. We're going to take a new sticker and put it where the other side is, and we're going to take the wire off, the clip off, and put it on the other side. All you really need is to change V4. Now, like I said, Typically, people change V4, V5, and V6, but you really, in the big picture, need to do that because all we look for in lead V4 on the right side is one millimeter ST elevation with upright T wave, and that's what we're looking for. We don't really care about, in the big picture, what happens to V5 and V6. You certainly can do that, and you'll see the same phenomenon. You see ST elevation V5 and V6, but I always think about why are you doing that because all we care about is what happens in V4. So take V4 from the right side, keep the sticker on, take a new sticker and put it on the same basically height where it is, it's supposed to be in the fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line, and take the clip, the wire off, and put it on the other side and get your EKG. One millimeter ST elevation with upright T wave in that section really um, tells you you have that. So here it is. So this is your right side elites. Here they removed V4, V5, and V6, all of them. But you really don't need that, like I said. Okay? So that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is you're going to look on the first EKG that you obtained, the first one that you got, you're going to look at lead V1. Lead V1, the first one that you got without changing anything. If you have ST elevation lead V1, that's an indication that your right ventricle is also involved. So that's where we worry about in lead V1. For posterior MI, what you're looking for is tall R wave and ST depression in lead V2. Sometimes it goes down to lead 3, sometimes it involves lead V1, but what we're looking for is tall R wave in lead V2 and ST depression in lead V2, and that's an indication that you're dealing with posterior MI. So let's go back to our EKG here. So 
This is our inferior MI. We look for ST elevations in 2, 3, and ABF. Typically, with right coronary occlusion, your lead 3 ST elevation is greater than lead 2. And we have reciprocal changes <coughs> in leads 1 and AVL, most commonly in AVL. So that's what we look for. Remember the reciprocal rule between elevation in lead 3 and depression in AVL. If you have that, we really suspect inferior myocardial infarction. Whenever you have ST depression in AVL, your eye should go right away to lead 3. Whenever you have ST elevation in lead 3, your eye should right away go to AVL, see what's happening there. If you have this reciprocal relationship, that is very concerning. Whenever we have inferior myocardial infarction, there are th two thoughts that come to our head. Is the right ventricle involved? Is the posterior involved? How do we look for them? In the same EKG, we're going to look for ST segment elevation in lead V1. In the same EKG, we're going to look for tall R wave and ST segment depression in lead V2. If we have those, then our clot is involving very proximally way up. In this patient, IV fluids is very important. We don't want to give nitros, we don't want to give beta blockers, we don't want to give morphine because all of those is going to cause this patient to have hypotension. So we give fluids. Fluids is very important in this patient. These patients are preload dependent. Like I said, it's good to know with respect to reciprocal changes where they are, but easier way to remember is if there is elevation, look for depression somewhere else. That's basically it. Don't worry about so much about lead. If you have depression somewhere else, that's concerning. Remember what we spoke before. For inferior myocardial infarctions, reciprocal changes are very common, especially when it involves the right coronary artery. Reciprocal change of inferior myocardial infarction typically involves the 3 and AVL like we talked about. However, remember, 20% of the time with anterior myocardial infarction, you will not have reciprocal changes. So absence of reciprocal changes with anterior myocardial infarctions are not unusual. So if you see it there, it's great. That's fantastic. It's there. But it's not there. That really is not, uh, if, if it's not there anymore, that's not that unusual. If it's there, it's very helpful. With inferior myocardial infarction, if you don't have reciprocal changes, that's very unusual. Think about something else. Maybe something else is going on. So here is our right-sided EKG. So remember, we're not going to remove the sticker. We're just going to take a new sticker and put it on the other side. It's in the fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. So we talked about all of these things again. This is just for your review, so you have it in your slides. Okay, what about here? This is a good example of what you have learned. So let's just see. So do we have ST elevations in inferior leads? We do, right? So we have ST elevations in 2, 3, and AVF. Do we have some reciprocal changes in AVL? Yes. So this is inferior myocardial infarction. Very, very likely, right? We looked for reciprocal changes. So whenever you have inferior myocardial infarction, which is something you'll see very, very commonly in your clinical practice, you're going to see tons of it in your career. We look for right ventricular involvement and posterior involvement. On the same EKG, our eyes should go to what lead next? V1. Do we have ST segment elevation in V1? That, what does that tell us? The right ventricle is involved. Do you need to get right-sided leads? No. No more. There's no need to do it anymore. We already know it. There's no reason for you to get it. Now, if you really want to, somebody is telling you, get me a right-sided leads, and they don't know about this V1 phenomenon, then you're going to say, sure, why? We'll get it. I'll get it for you. So what do you do? You're going to take only V4, get a new sticker, put it on the other side, take the clip off, and put it on the other underside, and going to get a right-sided EKG. Just make sure you mark that you only changed V4. 
You can change v5 and v6 too if you want, but you don't have to. And what we look for in v4 with right sided leads is one millimeter ST elevation with upright T wave, which you will see in this case no matter what. So if you already have it in v1, there's no reason for you to get right sided EKG. But a lot of times people wanted you to get it, so I just want you to know. Now, is there ST depression in v2? Do you guys see ST depression in V2? There is some ST depressions in V2, so poster is involved. Now, remember, the only way right, ventri right side will be involved is if the clot is before the bifurcation. So if you have right-sided features, you definitely have your posterior involvement as well because the clot is high. However, 20% of the population have their posterior descending artery coming from the circumflex. So it's not a 100% rule. You may be in that 20% now. So you have your right coronary artery coming down, giving a branch to the right ventricle, goes back. As it goes back and supplies the inferior part of the left ventricle, it gives a, uh, it gives a little branch called the posterior descending artery, which occurs in 80% of the time. In 20% of the population, the posterior descending artery comes from the circumflex, which comes from the left side and goes back. Okay? So you may have posterior involvement if the patient is dominant from the right side, from the left side. All right. So this is a kind of cool EKG. Let's take a look. This is kind of confusing, but if you understand one rule that we talked about, then it's not as confusing. This case is a really difficult one. This EKG is a really difficult one because you have ST segment elevations basically everywhere. So it makes you think, are you dealing with maybe pericarditis? Because with pericarditis, we'll see ST segment elevation in all the leads with an exception of AVR. So here you can see you have ST segment elevations inferiorly, and you do also have some ST elevation in the anterior lateral leads. However, there is one feature here that really helps us out. Remember, what happens if you have ST elevation? Where should you be looking next? What lead should you look when you have ST elevation in lead three? AVL, AVL. If you have depression in AVL, what do we have? We have inferior myocardial infarction. So this case, it's not pericarditis because you have depression in AVL, and in AVL depression in conjunction with ST elevation D3 really makes you think this is inferior myocardial infarction. So this is inferior myocardial infarction. The rest of the things are actually what's called early repolarization or normal ST segment elevation. So this patient is actually having acute myocardial, anti acute anterior myocardial infarction. And the only clue here, I mean, there are clues there too, other clues too, but the, the main big clue that you should really see that jumps out is the ST depression in lead AVL. And it's just basically this simple knowledge of reciprocal relationship between three and AVL really clarifies this EKG. So whenever you have ST elevation in lead three, your eye should right away go to AVL if you have a reciprocal relationship, you have depression that is basically inferior myocardial infarction un until proven otherwise. Whenever you have inferior myocardial infarction, you have that demonstrated, then you should look for right-sided and posteriorly, uh, posterior um, involvement. Right-sided, we look for ST elevation in V1, or we can get right-sided leads with V4, and we look for one millimeter ST elevation and upright T wave. For posterior, we look for tall R wave and ST depression in lead V2. All right, next one. This is something that very, very straightforward, but it is very confusing to many people when you initially try to understand what it is. But I'll try to, as much as possible, um, simplify this. This is left bundle branch block. And in left bundle branch block, patients have ST segment elevations. And you see that in, um, in, in your V1, uh, V2, V3, or so. These ST segment elevations are typically not more than five millimeters, and the ST segment elevations are concave. When you have 
myocardial infarction in, infarction in the setting of a left bundle branch block, it is hard to uh, recognize it because these patients already have ST segment elevation. So how do you know when somebody is having a heart attack in the setting of left bundle branch block? So there are rules for this, and it's called, many of you may have heard about it, it's called the Scarbosi criteria. And nobody really remembers uh, all these rules because it's kind of, I think, complicated to remember all these rules that you have to learn for your practice because there's so many of them, right? I think the better way to learn is to understand what is a normal left bundle branch block. And when you understand what is normal, then everything else that doesn't fit within that normal picture then actually is Scarbosi criteria. Scarbosi criteria is nothing more than describing an abnormal left bundle branch block. So why don't we just learn what's normal? Maybe that's easier. So in left bundle branch block, your QRS axis and your ST and T wave axis are always opposite to one another. So here we have QRS axis that's up and ST segment and T wave that's down. That's what we want to see. They should be always opposite to one another. So your QRSs are up. If your QRSs are up, then ST and T wave axis should be down. If you have QRS that's down, your ST and T wave should be up. It should always be opposite to one another. So in left bundle branch block, our QRS axis versus ST and T wave axis are always opposite to one another. If that's up, then the other two should be down. If it's down, the other axis should be up. This should hold true for every lead. In addition, your ST segment elevations should never be more than five millimeters. And that's a rule that we already know. Remember in our first section, I gave you this rule that applies to everything. Anytime you look at an EKG, any ST segment elevation more than five, it's concerning. That applies to left ventricular hypertrophy, that applies to pericarditis, that applies to left bundle branch block. All right, so that's all you need to know. Now, what is abnormal here? Abnormal phenomenon would be if it's more than five millimeter. That's abnormal. What else would be abnormal? So if your QRSs are up and your ST and T wave is up, that's abnormal because when the QRS is up, your ST and T wave should be down. How else it could be abnormal? If the QRS is down and your ST and T waves are down, that is also abnormal because when the QRSs are down, your ST and T wave should be up. So there's this phenomenon called discordance and concordance. We want discordance. Discordance is normal. Concordance is abnormal. So in the left bundle branch block, the QRS and STT waves, they act in opposite directions. That is what we want to see. If for some reason or another they're concordant, that is abnormal. So that's basically in a nutshell what we just talked about is Scarbosi criteria. So you don't have to really learn about all these features, just learn what's normal and you can figure the rest out yourself. So in left bundle branch block, we want discordance and we want STs to be less than five millimeters. When those, any of those features, any one of them, they don't meet, then that's concerning. Certainly it's very concerning if you have a QRS up and ST up, that's very concerning. That's not what you should see, right? So let's look over here. Now that you've learned discordance and the ST is more than five. So this was an EKG that they had obtained in a patient with left bundle. And do you guys think this is a normal left bundle or there is a hint of MI going on in there? How high are the ST segments? Pretty big, right? Something like maybe five or so. But is there a lead that has concordance? What's going on here? 
Is your QRS up or down? QRS is up. Where should your ST segment be? Normally should be down. This is up. This is not usual. So this patient is actually having more likely anterolateral MI than rather than the left bundle branch block issue. So you've learned now about the very common things. These are, this, this is a situation that you'll see every, every shift that you come in. You're gonna see this very commonly. You're gonna see left bundle branch, left ventricular hypertrophy every day you work. This is a very common phenomenon. You need to really understand the issue of discordance and the five millimeter rule, understand the inferior MI. You're gonna see MI, inferior MI in your career so many times. You gotta understand where to look for. When there's elevation in lead three, we look for AVL change. We look for V1, we look for V2. Those are very important. All right, so we talked about all of these as well, so you have it in your slides. All right, so some take home points. ST segment elevation with an inferior infarction involving the right coronary artery behaves reciprocally between lead three and AVL, so look for that. Look for V1 and on the same EKG before you get your right-sided leads. Remember, for right-sided leads, all you need to remove is V4. Again, I emphasize, do not remove the first sticker. Keep the stickers on, just get a new sticker and put it on. That is something that oftentimes you have to discuss it with your staff. Oftentimes you are not the ones that get it. You may order a right-sided leads. I always recommend it's better for you to go in there and make sure this is done correctly the way you want it to be done because that may not happen the way we're talking about. And remember what is a normal left bundle branch block. All you need to learn is what is a normal left bundle branch block. If it doesn't follow normal, just, you know, that's not right anymore. Don't worry about does it meet Scarbosi criteria or not. Basically, what Scarbosi criteria is, just defining what is abnormal. Just learn what normal is, and the rest will be fairly straightforward, so you don't have to memorize anything. 